Good afternoon. Thanks all for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome everyone to Bioethics Grand Round, sponsored by the Center for Bioethics and Social Sciences and Medicine. Uh, I am uh, Andy Schumann. I have the privilege of co-directing uh, the Clinical Ethics Service through the Center. Uh, and today we have a special treat. So there's been a long tradition going back many years of having uh, members of our medical student community present uh, at Bioethics Grand Rounds. And today is a really nice example of that simply because it is not simply a lecture, but rather a culmination of a process that we've started a number of years ago that medical students have been uh, closely associated with. So uh, the goal today is to talk about preventative ethics rounds. And of course, the first thing to do is to define what that actually means, but really to advertise and share what we as a center and what we as an institution have been piloting for the past two plus years. Um, which largely uh, is uh, the brainchild and work of Dr. Fern. Uh, so I'll introduce her first, even though she's actually not going to be giving the talk, but much of this is based upon her work and she'll be available to discuss and answer questions at the end. So Dr. Janice Fern uh, is uh, the clinical ethicist for the center. Uh, she is the face essentially of ethics consultation and runs the preventative ethics service for us. Uh, she received her BS from Michigan State uh, an MSW from the University of Michigan and worked in palliative care for a while before going back for her PhD in palliative care, which she was awarded from Lancaster University two years ago. Since that time, she has been uh, the stalwart member of the Clinical Ethics Service and really is the reason for its success. So uh, my career trajectory here is very much based upon, in clinical ethics at least, based upon uh, the, the really amazing work that she's been doing. Uh, in addition, we'll have presentations today uh, by Sally Soleri. Uh, so Sally is a fourth year medical student here at University of Michigan. Uh, she is planning to apply in obstetrics and gynecology uh, for her residency. And she is a member of the Ethics Path of Excellence, uh, which is a co-curricular program here, which we've had for a number of years now. Uh, but she is also a pre-doctoral clinical ethics fellow. So one of the nice aspects of the new medical curriculum is that there is enough flexibility within the fourth year of medical school to actually conduct a pre-doctoral fellowship in medical ethics. And she is the second individual who is doing that. Uh, she has a background uh, with a strong interest in moral distress and has piloted moral resilience rounds uh, in uh, different patient units, which will also be part of this conversation. She received her BS in biomedical engineering from Columbia and a master's uh, from uh, Mount Sinai. And our final presenter today uh, is uh, Catherine uh, Fader. Um, uh, she is a second year med student as of next week, uh, who um, is also at the University of Michigan. She is an active um, and vibrant member of the Ethics Path of Excellence and has a BA in English Literature from Williams, as well as a master's in bioethics from Columbia and actually worked previously with some of my colleagues at Columbia and Cornell. Uh, her prior work was looking at behavioral and neurodevelopment uh, in neonates, as well as looking at gene editing technologies, which was the subject of her master's. Uh, so it is my privilege to turn the program over uh, to uh, our medical students, and I thank you all for your attention. All right. Thank you, Dr. Schumann. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, as he said, my name is Sally Solari. I'm Katie Fader. And today we will be talking to you about the use of preventative ethics rounds to identify, anticipate, and proactively address ethical dilemmas. Uh, by the way, I might be referring to preventative ethics as PE, uh, not pulmonary embolism, unless otherwise noted. Uh, so first and foremost, we do not have any disclosures. Uh, we are far too young in our careers, but maybe one day. We hope. We can only hope. So a brief overview of our talk. Um, first of all, we're going to be going over what preventative ethics actually is and why we feel that there's such a strong need for it. I'll be discussing the clinical impact of PE rounds, both for the providers and the patients. We'll be delving into what Michigan Medicine's models for PE looks like, uh, of which we have several. And then lastly, Katie will be discussing the ethical themes and demographic characteristics identified from adult ICU populations from PE rounds, specifically in 2016 and 2017. So before we delve into this presentation, we're gonna start with two patient cases for your consideration. These are real patient cases. One of them was a formal ethics consult, and one of them was a patient that was discussed on preventative ethics rounds. Please consider how they compare. Patient one is a 91-year-old female with a history of severe restrictive lung, dis lung disease. She's altered mental status due to increasing hypercapnia, 
and she does not have the capacity to make decisions for herself. So her older son is her durable power of attorney for healthcare decisions. The clinical impression of the primary team is that she's at a high risk of aspiration, would be difficult to extubate, and unfortunately is nearing the end of her life. However, she remains to be uh, at a partial code, code status. Uh, specifically, she would like to be intubated uh, if that is the appropriate level of care. And this is because she's successfully been intubated and subsequently extubated in the past. So it falls in line with her previous express wishes. However, the team feels like her clinical situation has shifted now. They feel that she's a high risk of aspiration and she would be very difficult to extubate given that her lung disease is becoming more and more progressive. So they're continuing the conversation with the patient's children. Uh, the patient's daughter specifically doesn't want intubation. The sons feel otherwise. And there are continual plans for family meetings. The ethical concerns here specifically, uh, just to highlight a few, are family disagreement, substituted judgment versus best interest in deciding for a patient, and appropriate levels of care. As you can imagine, uh, these factors are just a few at play here. And this is by no means a straightforward case. Patient number two is a 78-year-old female. She has metastatic colon cancer, difficulty tolerating feeds, she's severely deconditioned, and has multiple drug-resistant infections. The impression of the primary team is that she's a poor prognosis and her state of health has progressively declined during this admission. She's not a candidate for chemotherapy, for radiation, or for surgery. And PT's consult note said that meaningful rehabilitation does not likely, is not likely achievable for her. She remains full code and she's resistant to comfort care discussions. She's at full capacity and her family members are also very involved in her care. So the primary team is trying to continue to have discussions with this family and this patient, but they are very adamant that they want to pursue curative treatments if possible, particularly chemotherapy. Again, multiple factors here at play, but to highlight a few ethical concerns are family disagreement, goals of care and futility. So take a minute to mull over these two cases, how they might compare, how they contrast, and now push them to the back of your mind a little bit. We're gonna to return to them in a little bit, but right now I wanna briefly move to a 3,000 foot view. Simply to make the point that this is clearly not an issue specific to Michigan medicine. There are countless instances of ethically complex cases worldwide that the media often heavily covers. And while we'll never be able to prevent ethically challenging cases, what we do strive to do is to be more prepared for them. So how can we do that? Well, medical care is complex. Everybody here knows that. And it involves a lot of moving and dynamic parts. And sometimes that complexity can create conflict. So with preventative ethics, we can mitigate that conflict, ultimately resulting in increased quality of patient care and decreased provider burnout. So what is preventative ethics? Well, historically, efforts to improve ethics practices in healthcare focused on the works and the functions of an ethics committee, such as education, policy development, or formal consults that are placed for specific patients. But especially in the last decade, there's been a nationwide movement to focus on preventative ethics. In the simplest of terms, it's a way of engaging with healthcare providers to equip them with the tools to help prevent ethical dilemmas of the future. This can be done by a variety of things, patient debriefs, prophylactic case discussions, and ultimately trying to identify systems-wide issues and patterns that can be addressed. First and foremost, we respect the expertise of the providers that we work with. Simply put, they know their patients best. Our goal is to support and empower them to address the ethical issues they encounter throughout the course of their practice. So a few more definitions. This is gonna help create a context to think about the various levels at which our interventions are working. These are from the Institute of Medicine. We have primary, secondary, and tertiary strategy. The most common strategy we utilize is the last one in the form of our formal ethics consults with our pediatrics and adult committees. Today, we're gonna to be discussing how preventative ethics falls under all three of these levels of intervention, but primarily is a secondary prevention strategy in that we identify risk factors. Our goal is to have robust programming at all levels of intervention. And this can be visualized by the following graphic. I know this is a busy slide. You don't have to read it all. The main takeaway is that in considering the way an ethical conflict arises, shown on the top, you progress from risk factors to signs of differing moral perspective to the actual ethical dilemma. Well, you can identify various points along the development of this conflict that are possible targets for interventions, here shown in red. 
and the stages at which you intervene determine whether it's primary, secondary, or tertiary. Now, there are many benefits of PE, both for providers as well as for patients. And without PE, we are at a risk of being stuck in this vicious cycle where unaddressed ethical conflict can lead to moral distress, burnout, residue, and in turn, this perpetuates more ethical conflict. So I'm gonna take a step back now and define these terms for you and to show why this cyclical relationship is so toxic. First, moral distress. It can be defined as mental anguish as a result of being consciously aware of morally appropriate action, but despite every effort cannot be performed, whether it's organizational or other constraints. Moral distress can occur for several different reasons, including lack of ethical knowledge, poor communication, discordance among team members. And while the intensity of moral distress might dissipate with time, it never fully resolves if it's not addressed. This can create a lingering moral residue, if you will. This residue from various difficult ethical conflicts that one might experience over the course of their career will accumulate. And that is what creates the lasting effect of things like provider burnout. Burnout is more of a clinical syndrome between a person and their environment. It can cause reduced job retention or satisfaction. It overall negatively impacts the delivery of healthcare as a whole. So there are many ways in which a unit can build moral resilience through preventative ethics to combat this vicious cycle. By providing ongoing education and clinical ethics, helping team players evolve a shared language to address concerns. Providers will be able to feel enabled to speak up when they're concerned about their patient's care with these tools. And this ultimately is what builds the moral resilience. Additionally, by providing designated time to identify and discuss complex cases as they arise, practitioners will have an outlet to share and feel validated in their concerns. In many ways, our preventative ethics rounds get providers to consider ethical dilemmas and risk factors on a regular basis. Their interactions give them a heightened threshold for screening and awareness, and it allows them to engage in this ethical language on a regular basis as well. And this way, you can provide an indirect cultural shift. On the patient end, preventative ethics helps us provide ethical medical management. For example, by applying the four principles of Childress and Beauchamp, which so many people can reiterate, but might not always think about how we utilize them in actual practice, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, justice. Well, these are the principles that help provide the main framework to navigate the ambiguous landscape that is medical decision-making and management that often influences the quality of patient care and subsequent provider experience. So how did we get to Michigan Medicine's preventative ethics rounding? Well, in 2016, as Dr. Schumann alluded to, the clinical ethics service was formalized and Janice became our first official full-time clinical ethicist. And she's very much the backbone of this program. She's previously done interdisciplinary rounding with palliative care teams, and she saw an uptick of relevant knowledge and skills with team integration. So she sees the opportunity to apply this framework in an ethical context as a way to interrupt the pathway between moral disagreements and ethical conflict. And so began PE rounds here at Michigan. By doing so, we are able to enable early team-based ethic dialogues to become a standard of care and support providers in the early recognition of moral disagreement. This ultimately gives providers practical tools to discuss value differences productively and respectfully, thus reducing part of moral distress. So who do we do PE rounds with? Well, in 2016, we started with neurology and neurosurgery, critical care, medical, and step-down units. In 2017, we expanded to CT surgery, cardiology, pediatrics, and PED CT. And in 2018, most recently, we've expanded to the trauma burn ICU and the neonatal ICU. Now, before discussing the many different ways in which we conduct PE rounds on these different units at Michigan, it's important to recognize that when we expand this program, there's a great amount of thought and consideration put into how we can create a flexible model to meet the needs of each participating unit. Each unit was consulted based on their schedule, on their culture, to find the exact right method that is best addressing their ethical needs. And so, as you can imagine, there are many flavors. For example, typically discussions might occur outside of the patient room between providers. So though we don't regularly discuss these ethical conflicts with the patients, we do offer direct support to the patient or family if it's desired. For example, in the PCT surgery unit, there's a standing unit meeting with multidisciplinary providers and ethics is part of the discussion. 
We discuss all the patients on their roster, and we're able to provide input and insight by asking for follow-up questions and clarifying aspects of the case. Just this morning, for another example, we were rounding with adult ICUs. And in these cases, we tend to meet just with the social workers, and they are the ones who initiate discussions of specific patients that they identify at high risk. In this way, we rely on their expertise and their knowledge of their patients. Though there is no one-size-fits-all model for PE rounding, each collaboration is able to include ethics education in real time as related to each case in question. As a reminder, these PE rounds do differ from our formal consult service. Uh, and for those who aren't aware of what that is, uh, that is when we regular touch, as compared to formal consults, we regularly touch base with providers of a particular unit to identify these high risk cases instead of responding to a specific ethical conflict or question that has arisen in the case of a single patient. That is when the consults. So during the consult process, a formal note will be written and entered into the patient's EMR. The patient case is also discussed at monthly committee meetings. But on the other hand, patients discussed on PE rounds are not routinely discussed at these committee meetings and there are no formal ethics documentations in their charts. So let's go back to our two patients, if you can remember them. Now that we all understand what preventative ethics is, why it's necessary and how it works here, we're gonna compare these two. As a reminder, we had a 91 year old female patient with the lung disease and she has altered mental status, leaving her older son to be the surrogate of highest priority. She's currently partial code and she would like to be intubated per her children if it comes to that. However, the primary team does not believe that this would be medically appropriate care. And so the concerns at play here are family disagreement, substituted judgment versus best interests and appropriate levels of care. As opposed to our 78 year old female with the metastatic colon cancer, who has full capacity and in agreement with her children would like to pursue aggressive treatment, though the primary team feels that these are not appropriate given her status. The ethical concerns here are family disagreement, goals of care and futility. So a little audience participation. Can you guess which of these cases was the formal consult? The first one, the 91 year old female with lung disease and lack of capacity, or the second patient, the 78 year old female with colon cancer who wanted aggressive treatment? Show of hands for patient one. Show of hands for patient two. The second case was a formal consult in 2017. Unfortunately, by the time that we got involved, there was a huge level of contention and general mistrust between the team and the patient and the patient's family. To address these dilemmas, the ethics team engaged in multiple formal follow-ups and in-depth conversations, and these were required to navigate her medical management. Ultimately, the patient and family continued to resist comfort care discussions and the patient's status remained full code, despite the ethics consult team endorsing a unilateral DNAR if the primary team chose to do so. The patient ended up dying during a code despite resuscitation measures. The first patient was not a formal consult, rather discussed on preventative ethics rounds. By engaging with the primary team, we were able to provide guidance and language with which to navigate the ethically complex issues associated with her care. No, no formal consult was needed, and the patient was ultimately discharged to an LTAC and remained partial code throughout her admission. The primary team was able to continually engage in thoughtful discussions with the family throughout the admission. Can we directly assume that we prevented the consult from happening? No, I wish we could. However, we are able to provide support early on prior to the escalation of ethics conflict. We were able to brainstorm with the team for how to approach shared decision-making conversations and provide a framework for ethical decision-making. Like a smoke detector, we were able to react to the warning signs before irrevocable damage ensued. Had we engaged with the primary care team of the first case, perhaps the ethical conflict would not have escalated so far. And in comparing these two cases, I'm sure one thing that's apparent is that you can appreciate the stark difference in both patient and provider experience. So going back to our definitions of different levels of interventions, in addition to our primitive ethics roundings that I just described for you, there are other PE strategies that we have that more specifically target primary and tertiary interventions. So these models tend to be reflections. Uh, as tertiary or reflectionary strategies, we debrief difficult patient cases, such as the patient in case number two. However, in doing so, we are also able to sometimes identify the root causes of these events. And in this way, it also acts as a primary strategy. 
This allows us to engage then in targeted conversations on topics such as identifying spiritual distress or self-care practices to build moral resilience. So to go over a few of these, we have moral resilience rounds. This has primarily been piloted with the pediatric hematology oncology team. We started it in March of this year, and this was the basis of my Pathways of Excellence capstone project. Once a month, we meet with the interdisciplinary providers on the unit, and this is a standalone meeting. It is a meeting specifically dedicated to talking about ethical dilemmas of patients or talking about ethical ideas and themes in general. Resident Rounds is run by Dr. Naomi Laventhal, who's one of our mentors. This is once a month. It's unidisciplinary, specifically with the residents, as the name implies, and it's a standalone meeting again. She meets once a month both with the residents in the PICU as well as in the NICU. We also have mess rounds, also run by Dr. Laventhal. Again, these are monthly meetings in the NICU. However, these are interdisciplinary. And again, they are standalone ethics meetings. These are all unique strategies in that they are retroactive debriefs as well as proactive invocable sessions. And this means that we have the capacity to meet urgently in real time to discuss ethically complex cases with the primary team should the need arise. And so now that we've learned what PE is, why it can be so beneficial to our patients and our providers, and how it runs here at Michigan Medicine, I'd like to invite Katie up to discuss some of our preliminary data from adult ICU populations, specifically in 2016 and 2017. Hello, everyone. So, so far, you've heard about the various places <clears throat> and the ways in which we provide preventative ethics services here at Michigan Medicine. And what I'm going to spend some time doing now is discussing the data that we found in the adult ICU when conducting preventative ethics rounds. So I just want to highlight, you've heard about a lot of places this has happened. I'm looking at the ICU of University Hospital. We're going to look at the patients we encounter, and we're going to look at the issues that we discuss, because we want to learn more about what are we preventing, what are we seeing, and how can we continue to grow as a program. So what you're seeing here is just a snapshot of the growth that we've had in the mere course of a year. You see from 2016 to 2017, there's been an almost 100% increase in our patients that we've been able to reach through preventative ethics services in the ICU. And we've also almost doubled our encounters while still maintaining about the same percent of those encounters turning into formal consults. So I'm going to take some time with these themes, so settle in for a moment. But what do we talk about when we're on preventative ethics round? A little caveat in that, as most of you know, and as Sally presented with our two cases earlier, ethical issues don't happen in isolation. We saw a lot of different themes in a single case. However, for the purpose of analysis, what we did for 2016 and 2017 data is we created these themes or categories so we could identify a primary issue that was driving the conversation. So as I said, usually things happen in you know, some combination, but we're gonna go through the primary issues so we can think about what's really driving a particular conversation. So to start, systemic issues. This involves things like limited resources. So in an ICU, for example, you might only have a certain number of beds and you have to decide how to allocate them. Things like discharge plans concerns. Maybe you know, getting hospice placement for a patient is difficult or they don't meet criteria. Or home safety, a patient might have a condition where their home environment isn't conducive to supporting them. Next, we have family issues. These are times when family members might not agree with each other, or they might not agree with the medical team, which can lead to conflict. Mental health. So this category, you might be wondering, how does this quite fit in? Is this an ethical issue in and of itself? And I just want to also pause to say, for a lot of these themes, we're thinking about how do we identify risk factors? We're not saying at this point it's already snowballed into something that's an ethical dilemma, but we want to be able to screen. So when choosing these categories, there are different ways of screening. And for patients who might be admitted for suicidal you know, ideation attempts or substance abuse, these are patients who often lack capacity to make healthcare decisions. These are patients who often might not have social support. So in this, in this way, this helps flag for a vulnerable population that you want to keep on your radar when considering what might turn into a more complex ethical issue. Decision-making, very popular in the United States. We love our autonomy here. 
So what does this entail? This entails, what do I want to do about my health care? Who decides when I can't? And in the absence of an appropriate surrogate decision maker, how do we make a decision in the patient's best interest if a substituted judgment standard fails? This also constitutes patients who might want to leave against medical advice and how they navigate trying to make that choice as well. And end of life and goals of care. So for example, a lot of the conversations we have in this category or this theme revolve around code status and whether it's appropriate. As Sally alluded to, the cases that we discussed, patients really you know, wanted aggressive measures or didn't want to be a DNAR. So what we'll address with this theme is, is that an appropriate choice or is it futile to maybe want all those things? And diversity, much like mental health, this is not an ethical dilemma in and of itself, but these are things that might present barriers into delivering effective and appropriate health care. For example, a Jehovah's Witness, a very classic example of someone who might refuse life-saving blood products because it goes against a closely held belief. Or perhaps there's an Eastern culture where they believe that you shouldn't tell a relative of a very poor prognosis, and they want to keep that information from their relative. That comes into conflict with a lot of our Western practice. So it, it's a gateway for an ethical dilemma. And lastly, very straightforward, language barriers. If you can't communicate with your patients, if they refuse hospital-provided interpreter services, you're not going to be able to relay infor important information in terms of informed consent and procedures, and that's ethically compromising. Last but not least, the interface between the law and ethics. There are situations you'll encounter in healthcare where legal elements are involved, like adult protective services, child neglect, patient privacy, disclosing sensitive status, such as HIV diagnoses, or how you deal with patients who are vulnerable wards of the state. OK, so now that we've kind of gone through these issues, I know they're familiar to a lot of you here, but the reason I bring them up is it helps understand the analysis that I'm going to talk about momentarily. I want to hear from you, so I want to keep you participating. I want to, I'm going to name each theme, and by a show of hands, I want to know if you think this was the most predominant issue that was driving the ethics conversations during preventative ethics rounds in the ICU. So who thinks systemic issues were the cause of, of problems or risk factors? OK, so not so popular. Who thinks family issues? OK, I got a few. What about mental health? How about decision making? <laughs> How about end of life and goals of care? And last but not, oh, diversity. Uh, how about legal and ethical the interface and interplay between that? OK. So if you chose decision making, you can pat yourself on the back. If you decided not to participate in that poll, that's your autonomy. So I can't, I can't really complain. Um, but this, by far and away, was the most prevalent issue we encountered in our discussions on the ICU for preventative ethics, with goals of care and the end of life sort of care coming in second. So why is this matter? Why am I talking to you about this? Why is it important? In being able to see which issues are most prevalent, we're able to target practices and policies into how we administer healthcare to make it better for patients and improve how these you know, themes are encountered throughout the course of your care. I also want to point out that this is consistent with what we found in 2016. So we did the same sort of analysis of what issues were most prevalent. And it has been a theme that decision making has been, you know, a more dominant issue over the course of the two years. And once again, these things don't happen in isolation. I can't say that enough, but this is what's really driving maybe the primary issue. Okay, so what else did we want to look at? What else was interesting to us? Part of what we wanted to see is how the average patient encountered on preventative ethics ICU rounds compared to your average ICU patient. Are patients that are being discussed, are they in any way disproportionately represented in this context compared to who's normally admitted to the ICU? If so, there could be an issue of justice, there could be some other social determinant of health going on or other factor, and we want to be able to explore that. So what did we look at and what are you seeing here? For 2016 and 2017, we looked at race, ethnicity, primary language, we looked at sex, primary diagnosis, and primary insurance status. 
And I gave you an example of one of the characteristics, which is race. And you can see in 2016 and 2017, for the general population and for those discussed on PE rounds, it was actually pretty consistent. You know, it was about 85% Caucasian, for example, for the ICU admits, and we had about 80% for PE rounds. And it was it held for other races as well. And we found that this was the case when it came to ethnicity, primary language, sex, diagnosis, and uh, religion as well. And that's just not shown here, but if you want to ask me more about it later, I'm happy to show you numbers. So what was a little bit interesting? When it came to insurance status, we found that maybe things weren't so similar. When you look at, and this is only for 2017 we have this, but when you look at 2017 preventative ethics rounds, you see that almost a third of the patients discussed are on Medicaid. Whereas when you look at the general ICU admissions, there's less than half of that proportion on Medicaid. So this is significant to us because it means that this population that perhaps is more financially disadvantaged is being disproportionately discussed during preventative ethics rounds. And what we wanna know is what's at play that perhaps makes them more prone or at risk for ethical issues? And how can we target interventions to ameliorate that? So why does this matter? If I haven't convinced you enough, if you don't see that maybe this is a gateway into figuring out how to solve problems and improve patient experience in a way that promotes equity and justice, it matters because when you think about Sally's cases, when you think about the patients involved, these are complex issues that are occurring during end of life, during vulnerable ICU admission. These are patients, regardless of their ethical status, who are vulnerable and need protection from the healthcare system. It also matters because we're really anticipating what might become greater dilemmas. Like Sally's case illustrated, one patient had an issue that escalated to the point of multiple formal consults in irreversible like code status, and they ended up you know, dying during a code because they couldn't, they couldn't engage in discussions that might have changed that, where the other patient was able to engage in a more shared decision-making model. So this really does affect care. And we are anticipating, when you look at a 2010 study, which was co-authored by uh, our very own Dr. Verkler at a large academic institution in Atlanta, they looked at the prevalence of issues during ethical consults. They divided them into brief consults and full consults. And while the brief consults were still more formal than preventative rounds and still seeing it later, the issues were similar and a lot of the data overlapped. So we're really catching things by identifying these risk factors beforehand. Also, we just want to improve care for all patients and this is one mode and way of doing it. So how can we use it? It's important that we check our bias. In continually engaging in this type of analysis, we can see if there are patterns or changes. Is one population all of a sudden being disproportionately affected compared to another? It also is a way to look at other disparities. So if we do see that there is some sort of disparity or bias, how can we start to address that through policy and interventions that could target you know, at the primary, secondary, or tertiary level of sort of ethics prevention? So, You've heard a lot from us today. You've heard about a program that maybe some of you had never heard of before. 